Thanks guys for coming tonight. Um, you're gonna learn a lot from Erin. She is the animal control officer for Millis and Medway. Uh, she's also a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. She has been a wildlife rehabilitator for five years and she has been, um, she started out with Millis and Medway as the assistant animal control officer and now she is the head of the department as their full-time animal control officer. Um, such a nice small group that if you guys have questions, certainly just feel free to ask Erin, ask away. Uh, I am the Norfolk Animal Control Officer and, and you might run into me if, if Erin is busy, she'll ask me to come into your town and help out or if she is off for the day or in court. Um, so uh, we work together literally every hour of every day, uh, bouncing ideas off of each other, whether it's animal control related or wildlife rehabilitation related, etc. cetera. Um, she is a wealth of knowledge, so uh, I hope you enjoy her presentation. Thank you, Hillary. Well, Hillary introduced herself, I was going to, but she pretty much said um, everything about her, so uh, thank you, Hillary, for being here. So, uh, our wild neighbors and what we need to know to coexist with them. So, like Hillary said, my name is Aaron Millette. I am an animal control officer and a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So, just a little bit to touch on the animal control part. What exactly do, do I do? So, um, first and foremost, my job is public safety and the enforcement of animal control, sanitation, and public health and protecting people from animals. Um, I also attend court hearings. What, court hearings, whether or not that be for your citations or for animal cruelty cases, um, enforcement of local and state statutes and regulations, investigate complaints regarding animals, attend hearings for nuisance dangerous dogs, educate the public on health and safety concerns involving animals, zoonotic diseases, and animal husbandry, pick up deceased animals from roadways, impound stray homeless animals, coordinate efforts to locate owners of lost animals and adopt out unclaimed animals, maintain records and files, and respond to sick and injured wildlife. And that's just to name a few of the things. So what exactly is a wildlife rehabilitator? Wildlife rehabilitator or permittee is a person who has been issued a permit or who has been exempted from the permit requirement in accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts state law for the purpose of providing care, aid, and treatment to sick, injured, debilitated, or orphan wildlife with the goal of returning such wildlife to the wild independent of human aid or sustenance. Restrictions. A wildlife rehabilitation permit may not authorize the rehabilitation of endangered or threatened wildlife. Venomous snakes, black bear, moose, or white-tailed deer. A lot of the times we get calls like, oh, there's a deer in my backyard with a broken leg. Unfortunately, there's nothing we can do for that. Of course, we don't want the animal to suffer, so if it obviously can't get up um, and it is having a hard time, you know, call your animal control officer, we can help end that animal suffering. But if it's still ambulating, it can get around. Fish and Wildlife wants us to leave those animals alone and, and let you know, nature take its course. Uh, so why do animals need rehabilitation? Sometimes they're orphaned, their mother is no longer alive to care for them or has been separated. Um, so a good judge of that, sometimes uh, baby squirrels, you know, if you see a deceased baby squirrel, like right in front of you, a deceased mother squirrel on the roadway, and then you see baby squirrels that have come down the tree, you know, in front of you, chances are that was probably mom. So you can tell that, you know, they've been separated. Uh, injured, hit by a car, captured by another animal, infections, poisoning, various other reasons. Um, and there's a little groundhog. Glasses, rabbits, little squirrel, and the hedgehog for some reason, which we don't have here. Uh, so rehabbing with a Massachusetts state permit, so there's two different types of permits. You can have, hold a state permit or you can hold a federal permit. And then again, this is to provide care for the sick, injured, debilitated, or orphaned wildlife by trained wildlife rehabilitators and to provide criteria for the issuance of permits to such wildlife rehabilitators. Um, in accordance with the, the permits, um, persons exempted from the permit requirement may acquire sick, injured, debilitated, or orphaned wildlife and provide necessary care and treatment so that the animal may be returned to live in the wild independent of human aid and sustenance. So uh, the scope of the permit, no person except as otherwise authorized 
under the provisions of the law shall rehabilitate wildlife without complying with the provisions. So unless you hold a permit, you cannot take wildlife. It's illegal. And then, so these are your rehabbers with your federal permits. A federal permit is issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or other federal agencies um, that have jurisdiction shall be obtained by the permittee prior to receiving or rehabilitating any wildlife protected by federal law. This shall not preclude emergency care by licensed veterinarians, uh, salvage and rehabilitation of raptors by falconers licensed under the provisions and may be only taken under, undertaken in accordance with the provisions. Costs, any costs, charges or fees including but not limited to shelter, equipment, labor, veterinary or other specialist consultation or services, transportation, federal or other licensing fees and any other expenses associated with the rehabilitation of wildlife shall be the responsibility of the permittee. Donations may be accepted if otherwise permitted by law. We cannot charge to rehab wildlife and we do not get paid to rehab wildlife. So remember that a lot of people get frustrated with rehabbers when they call them that either they can't take them. Um, you know, this comes out of my pocket when I take animals. So whether or not I don't have the funds, I don't have the time. Um, you know, I work a full-time job 24-7, 365. I have a family. So be patient with your rehabbers. If they can't take it, they could be at capacity. They may not have the funds to do so. So just remember that. I think sometimes people, you know, they call you at all hours of the night sometimes, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, like, I found a baby squirrel. Well, I'm sleeping. <laughs> it can wait till the morning. I'll tell you what to do if you find it. So, um, you know, be patient. And then, uh, so let's talk about relocation of wildlife. First off, it's illegal to relocate wildlife in Massachusetts. Um, no person shall transport any fish or wildlife species in Massachusetts. The exceptions to transporting and liberating wildlife in Massachusetts include a permitted Massachusetts wildlife rehabilitator may transport within Massachusetts and liberate wildlife, so such as the animals that I care for. Once they're ready to be released, I can take them in my car and put them wherever I need to. A permitted Massachusetts problem animal control agent may liberate problem animals at the site of capture or may transport within Massachusetts such animals to a licensed wildlife rehabilitator for the purposes of euthanasia. So again, that goes with those problem animal control agents. They, a lot of people think when they call in a pack agent that they're just going to take this animal away from your house and they can't. So they either have to euthanize the animal or they have to bring it to a rehab or, or they have to release it on your property. So they can't relocate them either. Let's talk about why that's an issue. So some people think like, hey, I'm going to go drop this animal off in the woods. Lots of food there and shelter and all this stuff. Well, that's like me dropping you off in China away from your family and saying, have a nice day. Fend for yourself. You know, because you don't know where, where you're going to live. You can't speak the language. You don't know where you're going to find your food. Same thing with these animals. So these, the relocated animal may try to return to its original area and be hit by a vehicle. Squirrels, raccoons, and other wildlife can return 5, 10, or even 15 miles away. So with the scope of my permit, I have to release all the animals within 5 miles within the point of capture where I found it because they will try to return back to that home territory. Uh, a relocated animal will have more difficult time finding food, water, and shelter in a new, unfamiliar place. If the animal can't find these necessities, it will be stressed and may die. If food, water, and shelter are available on the new site, Chances are that the site will then already be occupied by other members of the same species and that they will not welcome a newcomer in the territory. They may drive the animal away or even kill it. If the relocated animal is carrying a disease, it may spread that disease to other animals in the area. Rabies is a special concern. Hillary can probably tell you too, like a lot of times in the summertime we get like distempered skunks or raccoons. They generally tend to pop up in the same areas. If the conditions on your property are particularly attractive to the animal and you move it out, other animals may move in to replace it. So especially with those pack agents, a lot of people think like, oh, I got a raccoon like in my chimney, I'm just going to call a pack agent and get rid of it. Well, that's all fine and well, but if you don't put a cap on your chimney, something else is going to come in and take, go ahead. Can you explain uh, what a pack agent is? Yep. As far as like a trapper or So a pack agent is a problem animal control agent, which is different than an animal control officer like me and Hillary. So we are only allowed to remove an animal from your home if it's sick or injured. We're not allowed to come in if it's a nuisance animal. So a pack agent would be like a licensed trapper, wildlife removal. Those would be your pack agents. So that's all fine and well if you have a problem, anim a problem animal 
But if you don't fix the solution and you're just removing animals, then some other animal is going to take up residence. So you have to actually fix the problem. You can't just remove the animal. You know, that's fine. You want to pay for it and do whatever, but it's just going to keep on happening. And a lot of these uh, pack agents will fix the problem too. You know, if you have uh, a raccoon in your chimney, they'll come and put a cap on your chimney too. With the Massachusetts state permit, there's only eight birds that we're allowed to rehabilitate. And those would be your mute swan, your turkeys, your European starlings, your rock pigeons, your rough grouse, your ringneck pheasant, your house sparrow, and your bobwhite quail. All other birds need to go to a federal rehabilitator. So when you're looking on the list on mass.gov because you found a cardinal, you want to look for a federal rehabilitator, not, a, not one with the state permit. Because they're all protected under the Federal Migratory Bird Act. Basically, like every bird is except for these eight. And then these are your mammals with the state permit that we can rehab. And these are not, we can rehab every mammal. There's no restrictions. But these are your basic ones that you're going to come across in your backyard, your, your cottontail rabbits, your eastern gray squirrels, your red squirrels, your flying squirrels, which a lot of people like, don't even know that we have because they're nocturnal and you never really find them unless they're grounded or something. Um, we have two types here, the northern and the southern flying squirrel. Your eastern chipmunks, your opossums, your raccoons, your skunks, and your mice. All of the larger other carnivorous um, mammals, we need to get special permission from Fish and Wildlife. Those would be your coyotes, your foxes, um, your otters, um, things like that. We would need to get special permission. And now let's talk about bunnies. Everybody wants to kidnap bunnies. Um, so they have a short gestation period of just 28 days. And they breed from February to September. I know a lot of rehabbers already have baby bunnies in for care. Um, their diet, they are herbivores, so they eat plant material, grass, that type of things. They nest in shallow depressions in the ground covered with fur, grass, and leaves. So when you're mowing the lawns, pay particular attention because a lot of the times these guys get mowed over. Um, the mother feeds twice a day at dusk and dawn, so you, when you won't even know she's there. Because um, she literally sits over the nest and just sits there and she's there for like two minutes and then she's gone and she does that so she doesn't draw predators to the nest. Um, and the babies leave the nest around three to four weeks so they're not there very long at all. And um, I'll get to that next. So these guys always are getting picked on by dogs and cats um, all the time, all the time. So they, they are, um, if you find them in your yard and they're the size of an orange, leave them be. They're okay to be on their own. I know it looks small, but they're fine. Size of a dollar bill in length, they're fine. Leave them be. A lot of people will pick them up and go, he just sat in my hand like this and didn't even move because he's a prey animal and you've scared him to death. So that's why he's stunned. So just put them back wherever you found them. Um, leave them be. When you want to get help is if they're hairless and out of the nest. We call them baby hippos because they kind of look like hippos. Um, if they're cold and lethargic, if they're covered in parasites, if they've been in a um, dog or cat's mouth, cats carry a bacteria called Pasteurella, which is deadly to wildlife. Um, if they have a broken limb, cuts, abrasions, or a head tilt, bleeding, difficulty breathing, or the fur is ripped from skin or puncture wounds, a lot of the times they get degloving injuries from these cats um, and they would need to seek help. But I will tell you, these guys, even for experienced rehabilitators, are extremely difficult to rehab. I'll tell you, like 75% of these guys die in, in rehab. They are just so, they stress so easily. And they'll be doing good for like two weeks. And I'm like, yes, I only got like two more weeks to go. And then they'll be on their own. And then they, they will just die from capture myopathy. So please, if you can, do everything in your power to put them back or to try to... Um, Renest them or let like your dogs. Like, so for instance, I had last year up in Medway Dog Park, I was working, somebody called me that their dogs had dug up a bunny's nest in the middle of a dog park. I was like, oh, perfect place to make a nest. So I went up there and there were only two people there. And I, so I found a wheelbarrow. And I said, do you guys come up here often? They said, we do. We come here like every day. So I said, I'm going to put the wheelbarrow over this enough so that mom could get under it, but yet the dogs couldn't get at it. And sure enough, I went back like a week later and those bunnies were still there. And you know why? Number one, because the dogs couldn't get it. Number two, there were only the two people there that knew. Humans didn't know because if everybody there knew about it, they'd be picking at those babies. And so when we leave things alone, you know, nature does its thing and everything is fine. So 
what you can do is you can place a tic-tac-toe pattern with string. I tend to use like sticks or something uh, with dental floss or flour over the nest. And then mom, so when she comes, she will, you know, she'll dig at that, get to her babies, and then she'll, she'll put all that nesting material back. So if that's been disturbed, you can tell um, that she's been there. If it hasn't, then obviously you know she hasn't been there, and then those babies would need help. Um, again, keep those pets away from the nest. Place a laundry basket, a wheelbarrow, a lawn chair, any object over the nest that you can. Um, put your dogs on a leash. You know, those are like, some people just will not do it, and they're like, you have to take them, you have to take them. It's like, just put the dog on a leash or something. Um, mother rabbits will not move their nests. They're not like other animals where they'll carry them off and bring them somewhere. They only will keep them there. So if she doesn't take them, then she won't care for them. Um, and like I said, they won't be there for very long. Squirrels, these are my favorite guys. Um, they have a gestation period about 45 days, and these guys go through two breeding cycles. They have one in the early spring, like now, and then they have a late summer breeding. Um, so they are omnivorous, meaning that they eat all different types. They will eat a little bit of meat, a little bit of plant material, a um, little bit of everything. They nest in trees. Um, they're on their own at about 14 weeks. And infant squirrels can fall from the nest. If uninjured, try to reunite them with their mothers. They will come back and take their babies and uh, move them. They usually have two nests, and I've actually seen them. I had uh, a nesting box in my front yard, and I actually saw the mother come. I have it on video. I couldn't figure out how to get it in here. But she actually did come, and she moved all five of her babies. So you can put, like, squirrel calls on. You can put it on YouTube and find, like, squirrel calls. And if you put those babies on a heat source, she won't take them back if they're cold. Uh, so they need to be warm, and she won't take them back at night because they are di diurnal. So um, so you want to try to do it during the day. If she doesn't come back during the day, bring those babies in at night, keep them warm, and then try again the next day. And obviously after day two, if she doesn't come, chances are she's not coming back. And then these little chipmunks, they're so pesky. They're always digging up everybody's job, but they are so cute. Um, they're born from March through September. They are omnivorous too. They nest in burrows under the ground. And they're on their own at about 12 weeks. Um, if the nest is destroyed by excavation or another animal digging, the baby will need to go to rehab. Chipmunks found outside the nest are likely abandoned. Uh, they're orphaned, but it's always good to wait a couple hours to see if the mother will return. If possible, place the baby on a heat source um, or a hot water bottle outside in front of the nest and see if, if she comes back. But chances are, if they're outside, um, then something's happened. And then uh, Virginia opossums. These guys only have a gestation period of 13 days. These guys are actually born embryotic, literally like the size of a bumblebee. And they are, um, so what they do is when they're born, they're born embryotic. They literally swim up the birthing canal into her pouch. And these guys actually attach to the nipple and they stay attached. And she only has 13 nipples. So if you're number 14, then you're out of luck because she can't, that's all she has. So those babies will die. Um, but those guys stay in her pouch for another 60 days where they continue to stay attached to that nipple and nurse. And that's when they will come out and they will ride on her back. So these guys are pretty cool. They're North America's only marsupial. Um, they, these guys are omnivorous, but we call them kind of nature's cleanup crew. They will eat everything from carrion, which is roadkill, to mice, to insects, um, to everything. They are nocturnal. Um, and they're on their own at about 16 weeks, and they usually nest in tree hollows or under buildings like your porches and stuff. Um, any possum that's found that's less than seven inches from the nose to the base of the tail, so not the tail itself, but from the nose to like its butt, um, needs to be taken to a rehabilitate. And they don't have a strong maternal bond. So if she loses one, she generally doesn't know. So if you see a possum by itself without a mom, generally it's orphaned. And striped skunks, these guys are one of my favorites too. Um, these guys have a gestation period of 63 days. They're born from April to August. These guys are also omnivorous. Um, these guys are really cool because they eat wasps. They'll like go into like a wasp nest. Um, they're mostly nocturnal, but they may be seen in the early morning or evening, especially during nor uh, nursing, you know, when they're nursing. Um, they're on their own at about 12 to 14 weeks. And they are rabies vector species, so be sure you wear gloves and limit contact when you're handling these guys. Um, and these guys do have a strong maternal instinct, so generally you'll see mom and everybody's tagging around, you know, following after her. Um, 
So waiting to see if mom will come back for these guys is, is generally a good thing. And then um, put them in like in a shallow box or like a laundry basket with a heat source and see if she comes back to get them. And raccoons, these guys, they have a gestation period of 65 days. They're born from March through June. Mothers can have one to eight babies in one litter. These guys are also omnivorous. They're nocturnal, but they can be seen out in the day, especially during baby animal season. So that's one of our biggest call, raccoons out during the day. That's OK. Um, generally, they're nocturnal, but um, they nest usually in trees, hollows, chimneys, attics, and barns. They, these guys are also a, um, a rabies vector species, so be careful. Wear gloves and limit contact. Um, try to reunite the babies with their mother. These guys, actually, I was out on a call with Hillary, and a woman called me. She had cut down some trees. And she found a baby raccoon. So Hillary was out busy with another call. So I said, OK, I'll go over as a rehabber and, and help her out. So I brought over a heat, heating pad and a box. And so I set it all up, got the baby in the box, heating pad. And as we were chit-chatting, Hillary had just come back from her call. And she pulled in the driveway. And she had a, like a floodlight on the side of her house. And we caught the mother running back to where the tree was. So she was coming to retrieve her baby. So at that time, we just all kind of left, let her do a thing. And then she called me in the morning to come get my heating pads. The baby was gone. So mom did come back for her. Um, and then most importantly, keep the babies warm and out of the way. So raccoons especially, like so reuniting babies with their mothers, best time to do. Like these guys would be night because mom's out at night. Um, same thing with squirrels, like I said, during the day. And then fishers. Um, so they're not fisher cats, they're actually fishers. Um, and they are, and it's funny that I say that because my husband was like, they're fisher cats. And I was like, actually, they have nothing to do with cats. They are part of the weasel family. The males weigh between 8 and 16 pounds, and the females weigh between 4 and 6 pounds. They measure about 2 feet in length in both sexes. They breed from February to March. They produce one litter a year, consisting of one to four kits with an average of three. Maternal dens are generally located high in a tree cavity. And then when they get um, older, at eight to 10 weeks, the, the mother moves them to, below, to a den below ground. Um, the kits are nursed until about four months of age. At five months of age, they are the same size of an adult female and can su successfully kill their own prey. They disperse late summer, early fall, and live solitary lives. They reach sexual maturity at a year old, and females produce their first litter at two years of age. And like Hillary said, we work very closely together. These are actually Hillary's fishers from Norfolk um, that she did a great job at wrangling up and getting them to rehab her because mom was deceased in the roadway, and these guys needed some care. So those are the babies there. Let's talk about red foxes. Lots of people call about these guys. Uh, they are susceptible to mange, and rehabbers get a lot of these calls. Um, so mange is caused by a sarcop uh, scar sarcoptic mite that burrow into the skin. It causes itching, scratching, and increased inflammation. Um, so it's actually not mange that kills these animals. It's secondary, secondary bacterial infections, starvation. So because the mite is just the mite, but they itch so much that they get bacterial infections. They... they um, get sick from the bacterial infection that they can't eat, they starve. Um, mange can be transferred to dogs. So if you give your dogs like hotworm medication, like ivermectin, um, that will help so that they don't get it. So like if a fox was laying in your yard that had mange, like you'd want to be careful that your dog doesn't go roll around and where the fox was sleeping. Um, so it is illegal for rehabbers to trap an animal unless it's easily catchable. And at that point, there's not much we can do. And I'm going to show you some pictures of something that I just um, came into. But it's the law. We cannot trap them. We have to get them with a rabies pole by hand or with a net. And by that point, they're usually so debilitated that there's not much you can do. Um, and it is, like I said, it is treatable if the animal's in decent shape. And gray foxes, which you generally don't see a lot, um, but they generally don't get mange because uh, the mite doesn't live too long on them. So the bottom picture is a fox with mange. And this one is kind of graphic. Um, this was a fox that I just picked up the other day in Medway. Somebody had called, but he was so debilitated. You can see the pressure sores here on his hind end, because he, he was literally skin and bone. He was a skeleton with skin. 
Um, so that's his rear end there. And then this is his head all covered in mage. And he, he's alive in these pictures. That's how bad off he was. So the most humane thing for me to do at that point was to humanely euthanize him. I mean, I wasn't going to try to save him. I mean, that's awful, in my opinion. Coyotes. These are another one everybody calls about. Coyote in my yard. Well, that's great. <laughs> Good for you. I never see them, so I you know, enjoy them unless they're um, you know, sick or something. But um, they can be seen at all hours. They're mostly nocturnal, but they also hunt at dawn and dusk. In places with few humans, they will hunt during the day, especially when feeding pups. Coyotes are usually shy, but if they approach, make a lot of noise, and act large to scare them, attacks on humans are rare. There's been seven recorded coyote bites on humans in the past 65 plus years in mass. Two of them were confirmed rabid. There's more attack, more people are killed by cattle every year. You just don't hear about it because it's not exciting. Coyotes can be creatures of habit, so if you see one at the same time and place while walking your pet, change your routine or timing. If you have a small dog and encounter a coyote, pick up your pet. If you notice a pair of coyotes following you, they are escorting you or shadowing you through their territory. Make sure you do not bother their den, especially this time of year when they have pups. Be careful because they will, um, if they feel threatened, they will, you know. Um. So this is kind of a cool picture. This is my dog, Harley, here. How much do you guys think Harley weighs? I, I apologize, the pictures are not that great, but what do you guys think she weighs? 45? What do you think? Take a guess. 30? 11. 11? Okay. So this, I apologize, this is bad. So Harley measures on a measuring tape 18 inches in length. Harley weighs 33 pounds. So last year, the Fox 4 ACO and I, she had picked up a coyote that had been hit by a car. So what better way to do some research on animals is to actually get your hands on them. So this was a young coyote. We could tell by its teeth that it was young because they, they were nice and white. Um, we measured its paws. We measured its length. Um, so this coyote measured 20 inches in length and weighed 25 pounds. So. They are really, and Hillary had one, did some same measurements on hers, and I think yours was in the 30-pound range, maybe? So, but to get to, to actually get into to its body, it was so thick with fur. People will call and say, this thing was the size of a German Shepherd, but it had to be 75 pounds. They're, I'm telling you, their, their coat is so thick um, that they're really not that big at all. So in essence, they really are. And we measured the teeth and everything too, and they were the same size as Harley's canines and, and um, same thing with the pop heads. We did all those type of things. And they're the same size as the dog, so they're not these beasts that everybody makes them out to be. They really are just a wild dog. So like I was saying to you, people call and say, oh, I saw a coyote. That's great, good for you. Like, like I said, enjoy it. You know, I love seeing wildlife in my yard, but there are times when I'm not going to say that isn't great. So when should you call me? When you see an, uh, an animal circling, falling over, staggering, hind limb paralysis, if they are lethargic, they have discharge from their eyes, nose, or mouth, self-mutilating, um, oblivious to noise and nearby movement, erratic wandering, seizures, sometimes um, raccoons or skunks will vocalize excessively. So those would all be reasons to call, you know, that, that tells me that this animal is sick, whether it be rabies, distemper, or something, but it's not normal and that, you know, you want to call. We want to take care of that. So another issue um, with wildlife is diseases and poisons. Wildlife can harbor an array of diseases. Some can be transmitted to humans, which would be zoonotic diseases. And certainly to pets, always wear gloves. Um, so rabies is transmitted through saliva, through a bite or a scratch. That's why we say like even with, um, even when you're scratched because animal licks their paws, which gets on their nails, and then they scratch you, that's why we say um, with the scratch. So parvovirus, um, you know, a lot of your dogs are vaccinated um, against parvo and you see that a lot with your raccoons and your skunks. All those animals get that, and that's why your dogs are vaccinated for that too, not just because of other dogs. Um, Bayless ascaris, which is raccoon roundworm, that is actually zoonotic. Humans can get that, so that is transmi transmitted fecal to oral. Uh, salmonella, so those um, 
especially with your reptiles. So if you have reptiles at home too, you can get salmonella. Um, so you always want to wash your hands when you're touching snakes and lizards, amphibians, those types of things. Leptospirosis, that's spread through urine. Uh, listeria, you know, you can get that with contaminated food. Lyme disease spread through tick bites. Hantavirus, you know, your rodents are going to um, spread that through urine, feces, and saliva. Tularemia, which is um, muskrats and rabbits, will spread that. And uh, mange, direct contact, that would be like the human equivalent of scabies. That's actually what scabies is, is, is mange. Um, and other deadly problems for wildlife, a big thing is rodenticide poisoning. You know, these people putting out rat poison to get rid of their rats and mice. You know, the rat leaves your house, goes out to drink water, and it's not moving so fast, and the eagle swoops down and says, well, this is an easy meal, and now this eagle has it. Well, that's great. Now the eagle's dead on the side of the road. Coyote says, free meal, and now the coyote has eaten the eagle, so you're poisoning all these these things. And not only that, but your outdoor cats too, you know, eating mice can, can get it. And then lead poisoning is big for your waterfowl. Those would be, you know, your swans and your geese and your ducks. Um, whether you're leaving your lead sinkers at the bottom of the, um, the bottom of the ponds or not only that, but the lead shot from the deer, you know, deer carcasses that these eagles are feeding on. And then uh, let's talk about our newborn, newborn baby birds. Uh, those are called hatchlings, and they're newborn two to three days old and have little to no feathers, and their eyes are closed. Um, their fl they're, uh, fluffy down are called nestlings, and they're about three to 12 days old. And their eyes usually open at three to five days old. And a uh, nest is usually three to seven hatchlings, and the fledglings are at um, 13 to 21 days old, and they're learning how to fly and self-feed. They're often found hopping on the ground. Mom is watching from a distance. These guys are often kidnapped like the bunnies, too. So usually a lot of times you'll find them like under a bush. So mom is tending to them from the trees, but they're learning how to fly now. Um, so she will feed them, care to them on the ground. Um, so depending on the species, um, the hatchlings, are usually like the size of a walnut. Some could be as small as a shelled cashew, which would be like your hummingbirds. Your fledglings, they leave the nest at about three to four weeks. So they literally like take from the nest and they just, just jump. Um, and they're the size of like a standard orange and they start to kind of lose. They have a little bit of fluff, but they're starting to get their feathers in. So they kind of look like a little bit of a mix. Um, and they do not need to be rescued, put them back. So they legit like will hop around on the ground. Um, and, and leave them alone. Their parents are close by watching them. And this guy on the bottom here, the bottom right, this is what a fledgling looks like. So he's got a little bit of those fluffy feathers, but he's just starting to get his pin feathers in. And then so what do we want to do with the bird's nest if we can find one? Uh, if you see where the nest is and you can just pick the bird up, put them back in. Um, if the nest is destroyed, you can re reconstruct one um, with a similar with a similar structure, um, you could use like a, sometimes we use like a butter container. You can use one of those. Uh, you don't want to put anything in there that like they can get their um, little feet wrapped around like a loose towel strings or something like that. And that's just a myth, um, you know, about like your scent with all animals. They will come back. Um, the parents feed these guys every 20 minutes. So as long as, as it is, if it isn't dark or cold, um, they will come back, but if it's overnight, they won't. So bring them in, keep them warm. Um, you can, like I said, put them in a plastic bin or a container, a felt, small knitted hats or other warm cloth, no big loops or anything that they can wrap around, and a heating pad set on low or hot water bottle, and I'll show you guys um, some stuff to keep them warm. And no original nesting because it could contain mites. So injured or orphan animals, what to do immediately? Wear gloves. So depending on the species, you're going to want to use, you can use like your regular old garden gloves or something, um, or your regular old, you know, um, nitro gloves. Um, heating pads. So a lot of people don't have something like this. This is like just like a dollar store container that has some holes drilled in it on the top and on the sides. But you can most certainly just use your regular old everyday cardboard box with some holes drilled in it. I have these things called snuggle safes, which are you know, fairly expensive, so the average person isn't going to have them. But these heat up, and they stay heated for eight hours. So I would take that, put my, heat that up, put the towel on it, and put the container on it 
like that with the baby inside, you know, wrapped up in a, in a towel. But you guys aren't going to have anything like that, chances are. So what you guys can do is there's a couple different things. You can, if you don't have anything, you have some hand warmers, you can use these. You can, this is just another heat pad from the dollar store that you could use. You could even use a sock filled up with rice. You could even use a water bottle that you have at home, fill it up with hot water. None of these things, you never want to put the baby directly on heat. So all of these things are going to go at the bottom of your container here like so. You're going to put a towel over it so the baby's not directly on it. And then you're going to, you know, wrap your baby up in another towel because you never want the baby directly on heat. It's best if you have you know, the hot water bottle, and the only other thing I don't care for, this gets cold really, really fast, you're going to have to keep on refilling it. Um, this, you could put underneath this box here too, you know, wrapped up like in a towel, or like same thing with your rice sock underneath the container like this, because these get really kind of hot too. The only thing about all these things is they don't stay warm for very, very long, so you just have to keep an eye on, um, you know, how long they're staying warm for. But, most important thing for these guys is these babies can't thermoregulate, so they can't control their body temperature. So they get cold, and what happens with us is if they get cold, they come into us um, hypothermic. We can't feed them right away. We have to get them hydrated and warmed up. Um, so you want to make sure that you um, keep them warm is like the number one most important thing. You never want to offer them food or water because if they are hypothermic when you get them to, number one, you could feed them the wrong thing. Um, if they are hypothermic, they cannot um, process those foods. And a lot of people will go online and Google and they'll say, what can I feed this baby? Well, then you're feeding it KMR or something like that, and that's not what they drink. So it's best to um, just keep them warm, dark, and quiet. You know, put them in that container, start calling around, keeping them warm, and then, you know, we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, these are just some skunk dog recipes. If your dog gets hit by a skunk, you can use hydrogen peroxide, baking soda, and dish soap. Tomato juice, which I, I don't care for. I don't think it works all that great. Um, we were actually, I was just at a um, training with some other ACOs, and she said that she does like this um, douche. Believe it or not, that's what she says she uses. And I, uh, they do have a skunk off shampoo that you can use. I particularly like white vinegar. I don't know what your go-to is, Hillary. Oh, white yeah, but she swears by the the deuce that she's like I buy it in bulk. Um, helping turtles cross the road. We often see turtles trying to get the street. Often try to help uh, see them trying to cross the street. We can help them. Um, you always want to put them in the direction that they're going. Never turn them the opposite way. Like they know where they want to go. Um, snapping turtles. Don't be scared of them. You can pick them up by the back like he has his hands here, two hands at the end, and just carry them through. You can carry them like a, like a platter, depending on the size of them, literally just like this. Um, you can take your car mat if you're that scared. Throw them. You can take a shovel, but you never want to pick them up by the tail, um, anything like that, because you will, you know, their spine is attached. Um, they can spin around and, and snap, but I'll be honest, I've never had them do that. Um, so again, and after touching these guys, wash your hands because they can carry salmonella. But the thing is, that is a cracked shell, but turtle shell is bone. A lot of people just think it's like this rock or something that they carry, but it's actually bone. And their spine is attached to that bone. And underneath that, all that bone, they do have internal organs, liver, spleen, all that kind of stuff. So depending on where they were hit, how bad the break is, you know, they, it could be repaired. A lot of people do some, like, incredible shell repair um, with these guys. But reptiles take twice as long as mammals to recover. So, like, uh, something that would take, you know, six months for a mammal to recover would take these guys a year, year and a half to um, to recover, but they do, depending on where it is, they can, they can fix it, but, you know, a lot of people just leave them. It's like, don't, don't leave them there. You know, call somebody or um, pick them up and try to find somebody to help them. So um, saving and transporting them, again, wear your gloves. You can throw a towel over. So another thing with the snappers that I learned, too, not that everybody has one in their car, 
Um, you can use a, um, a plunger to stick over, their <laughs> stick over their head or a coffee mug if you're like worried about their, um, their mouth. And then uh, you can take a towel, put it over their head. A lot of birds, like your swan or your geese, if you're trying to capture them, if you throw a towel over their head, they usually calm down. Uh, scoop the animal up and place in an appropriate size container. Um, just like I showed you there, this is all those kind of um, things. Call a rehab or if no one is available, you may try your animal control officer. Um, it's tough. We don't have the resources to always, you know, be running around trying to find rehabbers. We're in the same boat that you are. Like when you're calling people, we're trying to call people to try to find people to take the animals. So um, this is the mass.gov site. Tells you how to find a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. It shows you you can find them just by species if you found a bird. If you found a mammal, reptiles, you can click on all this. It will tell you specifically like what they will take, what they won't take, where they live. Um, and then you can start calling around. And that's, that's it. Hope you guys got a, uh, I know that was like a lot of information that I <laughs> threw at you. Um, but I don't know if you guys have any questions. I'll be happy to answer any of them if I, if I can. You don't have to do rat, uh, raptors? No, so you would need a federal permit for those, yep. Yeah, yeah. So you'd, so again, on that list, you'd want to look for somebody that's got a federal permit if you ever had somebody. Um, and now we have that avian bird flu going around, which is a big concern for all the waterfowl and wild birds and all that stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think they're seeing it more spread like throughout the wild bird population now. I haven't heard like a lot of domestic cases, but I've seen it quite a bit in the wild birds now. Yeah. So Aaron, what would be your recommendation if say someone from the public or a passing motorist saw an animal um, not in the act of being hit by a car, um, but is acting neurological, like your symptoms of staggering. Would you want the public to do anything besides contact animal control? No, I would just want them to call because especially if they're acting neurological, chances are they could be either rabid or distempered or they could potentially get bitten you know, that's definitely, and it's, chances are it's going to be one of your rabies vector species. So again, you know, your rabies vector species, your raccoons, your groundhogs, your um, skunks, um, foxes, things of those. Any mammal can, can carry rabies, but those are your, um, your, main, your main guys. And not only that, even if it is neurological just from being hit by a car, Two, an animal in pain is going to react differently than anything else. And if you don't have proper PPE or proper handling skills um, to touch those animals, then you're going to get hurt. And then it's going to lead into a whole big issue for, for you as well as the animal. So it's best to just call, you know, your animal control officer or the police non-emergency line and let them know what's going on and, and let us handle it. Is the woodchuck Yes. Rabies vector species, they are. Yep. Can you explain why possums is really rare for them to contract? So, once again, they are a mammal, so they can contract rabies. However, their body temperature is very low, so that's why they believe that they don't, um, that the virus doesn't live very long in them if they were to contract it because it doesn't, um, what's the word I'm looking for? can't really manifest because their body temperature. So it's not impossible for possums to get rabies, but it is, however, very rare for them to contract it.
they do. Well, that's, and it's not so much that they actually eat them, like that they go digging for them, it's that they're such wonderful groomers that they're constantly grooming themselves. So if they're on them, they're, you know, lapping them up and, and eating them. So, um, mm-hmm. Well, thank you guys all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a ton of things. I hope I answered a lot of your questions that you had. As always, feel free to reach out, call my office if you have any questions or concerns. Always happy to help. All right. You guys have a wonderful evening. You're very welcome.